childhood, then youthhood, old age, death, purgatory, the day of judgment, resurrection, and inshallah, paradise. Now, each one of these stages requires to study from Quran and Hadith. Quran has over 6,000 verses, and a third of the whole of Quran is about our life in this world. And there are many, many ahadith that describe the human development. And what I was listening earlier on was about the, the youth development. And most of those things are similar in the Islamic world. Unfortunately, the Muslims did not develop their social sciences, like psychology, sociology. After the Islamic Revolution in Iran, they are now working on them, but still not to the level where some of the Western countries, especially um, Europe and more than Europe today, uh, North America. America has done the most research even today. More than 50% of the world's research is carried out in, in America, which is, uh, which is good for them, but quite negative for us because we are supposed to be doing most of the research, but we don't seem to be doing any research. Now, there are two main theories in psychology about the child development. One is of Freud, um, and the other one is his student, Eric Erickson, um, who goes into describing, Freud says there are five stages in human life, and Eric Erickson says there are eight stages. I don't want to go into those. Based on a hadith, um, I was a psychology student, and, and my wife is a psychologist, we sometimes share our notes on, on developing many of those series, but we never get around writing any of those things. Um, so I do have a lot of lectures and speeches on these topics, but I have not, unfortunately, written up anything. So complaining about other people not doing research, I'm on the, on the same boat as the rest of the people. Not writing up enough because of my traveling and continuous lectures. Um, I have, uh, although published a few titles, but, um, and I wanted to show some of the, the, the works that are related to this topic. Now, Sharia says that your lineage, your own, when a father carries all of those genes, all the sins and all the things that you do affect your children. Imam Jafar Sadat says, oh. He 
says that, you know, when a person came to him and he said, Mawla, last night I was saved from such and such sin. The Imam said, because your father saved himself from such a sin. Because he saved himself, so you inherited tendencies. In, in the Western culture, they call them tendencies. Yes, you tend to, to have uh, to have anger. Yes, a child even has a lot of anger because the parents had it. So the genes have transferred to the child and they feel it. Yes. So before anything else, you need to do your own development. You need to improve to give all of those things to your children. Very famous hadith by Amir al al Islam, he says that um, do not impose your personal understandings and teachings onto your children because they are one generation ahead of you. One generation ahead of you. So they have everything that you had and then they have more. So all of your things are transferred to the children, to your genes, and they have more. So they are one generation ahead of you. So you're basically competing with a generation that is basically much more intelligent um, and much better equipped and geared with the responsibilities of this life than any one of us ever were. Okay? So we need to realize that. Now I'm trying to rush very quickly because my time is short and I had written up a, a number of things. Now, very quickly, I'll go into the stages described by a hadith of the different uh, levels. From so, I had mentioned that your genes, basically, when you are carrying them, they, your own akhlaq, your own beliefs, your own practices have an impact, and you give those genes to your children. Now, one of the most important stages of uh, child development is the womb of the mother, and anything that the mother listens to, sees, hears, does, and says will have an impact on the child. Now, I don't want to go into some of those things because it's, it's parenting that we're talking about. So I'm not going to go into the child development, but parenting, as a parent. Now, uh, recently we had a big issue in, in London. London has, as you probably may know, half a million Shia population. Yes? So we have about 400 to 700,000 Shias. We don't know exact figures, but anyway between 400 to 700,000 Shias in London. London is called Little Najaf uh, because it has somewhere around uh, more than 300,000 Iraqi Shias, yes? So many parts of London like Brent uh, have, you know, an Iraqi mayor and, you know, like, so it's, it's a very developed city in terms of Shia teaching. It has uh, Shia school, Shia college, future plans of university, many things, you know, it has so many mamalgas. Now recently one of the scholars once read a hadith that um, the kind of things you do will have an impact on your child. There are many hadiths in that. I don't know going to those. And one of the children came and said to the parents, you must have done these things because I have them. <laughs> now that sort of triggered off a whole debate and the parents started feeling that, oh, what have we done for our child? You know, I'm like this because you've done something wrong. Okay? <coughs> now, it is not exactly as that because I'm amongst the parents so I can say that. Okay? Um, what happens is that it does have an impact, but it is not, we're not, we don't believe in complete predestined things, yes? Predestination. We don't believe that everything is taqdeer, predestined, yes? A person has a lot of role to play in their life, so it is not completely predestined. And we're not much better, you know, we don't believe in jabr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We don't believe in complete compulsion, yes? That Allah has completely, because of my sins, my children will have to see the consequences. So we don't believe in that, okay? We need to have these concepts clear so we can give those clear concepts to our children. The womb of the mother and then the child. Early childhood is extremely important. Now, the first part is up to the age of three. Ayyam al say up to the age of three, the child does not differentiate between good and bad. But around the age of three, the child now starts to differentiate or um, that psychological hadi or the guide comes to them. And there is a hadith by Muhammad islam that says that, you know, seven, seven and seven years, the first seven years they are your masters and then the second seven years they are your servants and the last seven years they are your friends. 
And after that, they've already become what they've become. Either they're your masters, or your uh, servants, or your friends. Now, from three till, till, till seven is again another development age where you are supposed to be growing their potential. Their learning abilities are on the peak. And many of us say do not give them any pressure. Yes? But that's when they are learning the most. And you need to give them positive. She had also talked about positive and negative. Um, but you need to give them the positive attitude towards everything. Rather than saying, you're too stubborn. You're, when you criticize a child, the child grows up with all of those things and starts to believe in herself or in himself to be that. So don't do that. Okay? Be positive. Rather than punishment, reward. Whenever they do something good, then, then praise them for it. That, oh, why did you do something wrong? You're not a bad child. You're a good child. So, positive reinforcement, as a call it in psychology. I, Madam Muslim, say whatever you tell the child, the child has to believe it. Okay? Children ask a lot of, you know, they're very curious. I don't want to go into that because the, the, the topic is teenage. Now, I'll, I'll leave all of this from 7 to 14 of Bulu. Um, and Bulu uh, for girls is 9. And there are other signs. I don't want to go into that. And for, for boys is 14 or even before that, whenever they become bilid. And a lot of the children are now, as you heard earlier on as well, they become bilid earlier than they age. Especially in Western culture. They develop very quickly. And then... Uh, starts um, behavior disorder because there are a lot of confusions and they do not understand how to tackle all of those changes that are coming to them. Now, I want to very quickly give you a balance in life. There are five things which have balance in life. This is a summary of uh, a, a whole book, 800, 900 pages. <coughs> Or Mehraj Sada. The father and son both wrote books. Um, the father wrote it in Arabic and the son wrote it in Farsi. Mehraj Saada. And the Urdu translation is Uruj Saadat. Uruj Saadat. Saadat's prosperity or success in life. We all want to be successful. What is a success in life? And the summary of their book is there are five things which are balanced in life. Okay? You have to try and develop those things in your children. You need to try and make them these five things. What are those five things? The first one is justice. You need to make them adil. And Marhum Narati argues that there are two extremes to all of those five balances in life. And these developments are happening at a teenage stage. So you can make them adil. Yes, they are just or fair. You're not fair to me. Yes, this, this term you probably hear all the time. I don't know if it is a British term or Australians also use it. You're not being fair, yes? Being fair is being just or being adil. Okay, being fair, yes? Um, so we need to have justice. And the two extremes are dhulm, yes, and tamkeen al Oppression. If you're not adil, then you're oppressing or you're providing the means of oppression. Do I need to explain this a little bit more? Okay. Just, being just is that you don't oppress others and you don't provide any grounds for oppression. Oppressing others can be, doesn't have to be physical. Yes? Even just to give a look to someone. Yes? You give a look to your child or another person, men do it more than women, but a lot of women do it as well. You give a look and you tell them who is in control. Yes. And you give that look, yes, with anger, and then they know. So that can be sometimes oppressive, according to Masumi and Muslim. Because you never ever look at someone stronger than you like that. Because you know they'll take a rise out. Yes? So you only look at a person weaker than you with those oppressive Eyes, yes? So that has to be balanced. And the other is tamkinagul, to provide the grounds. You keep taking it and the other keeps oppressing you. 
both are haram. Oppressing in this and providing the grounds for oppression. Both are forbidden in Islam. Okay? So you should not be providing the means for others to oppress you. You should speak out. Justice is the balance. The second is generosity. The second um, um, term or characteristic is generosity. The two extremes are miserliness, and that's what you need to develop, try and develop generosity in your children. Don't make them miser, and do not make them extravagant. Miserliness is to hold back and not spend. And extravagance is to spend more than required. The Holy Quran says, indeed, the extravagant people are brothers of shaitan. Yes, extravagance for the haram. So wasting because when you are, when you have a lot of uh, wealth, then you teach your children many times without realizing to waste rather than give. So you would spend on yourself, but you would waste it rather than give to someone else who is more in need. So generosity is required. So you give away what is um, surplus to others rather than waste on yourself. I have a game and I'll buy another one. I have an iPhone and I'll buy another phone. I'll buy another iPad, I'll buy another laptop, I'll buy another computer because I've got enough. So rather than giving someone else, you, you waste it on yourself. You just spend it on yourself because you think you deserve it more, it's yours. So you as te you know, in your, your children who are teenagers, you need to teach them that they must not be extravagant or miserly. Hold back what is not theirs. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that he gives you extra to give others, not to hold back. Okay? The third is courageousness. Shuja, yes? The people who are who go out for you know looking for trouble, they become bullies. And bullying happens not only just in schools but also in household. Older children sometimes bully younger ones. And the parents have to look after look after the you know, as parents, you are responsible for not allowing the bullying to happen in your in your in your family. Okay? You should not bully each other, husband and wife should not be bullying each other, and many times they do. And disrespect to each other. You're teaching your children how to treat you. If I can convey that, I don't know why I can. How you treat each other is what you're teaching your children how to treat each other, yes? How to treat you. If a husband is disrespectful towards a wife, then he is indirectly telling the children that's how you have to treat your mother. If a wife is disrespectful towards a husband, then she is indirectly telling the children that's how you treat your father. And if you both treat each other like that, then you tell your children, treat us like this, please. Yes? That's what we deserve. And they pick up those things from you subconsciously, and that's how they start treating you. So respect to each other goes very well into the children. They learn. There's a, there's a whole survey that 80 or more than 80% of the children who come from broken families go on to breaking families. Yes? They go on to divorcing and all of those things you know, because they've learned that from their, their, their parents. The fourth thing is wisdom. To be wise, not to be crafty, not to use other people and not to um, not to be a foolish, yes? Both are wrong. Some people think, yes, only foolishness is wrong. But if you overuse your brain, then you're very intelligent. You're not intelligent, you're crafty and the craftiness is obviously a negative characteristic. Um, and not a positive one, okay? So don't use other people for your things and don't be used by other people. Always be wise. I don't want to go into any of these things. And thus, that's what you need to develop your children into becoming. And the fifth thing is chastity, haya. Yes? You should not let your children be immobile, you know, immobility when they are basically completely um, of any relationship and they become too excessive. Oh my Prophet, have you seen a person who has taken his desires, his hawa enough to be his God? So your desires should not become your God. Okay? 
very quickly, I, I, I think I still have about um, half an hour. Yes? Now, understanding your child is extremely important. And I want you to go on, on a number of things, but I'll quickly jump on to the next stage. So these are the five things that you need to keep in balance. Now remember, communication is the key between you and your child. You think your child understands you without you saying anything to them. Do you understand everything and anything without someone communicating it to you? Then how can your child understand what you're not communicating to them? Okay? So you need to communicate with your children. What is communication? We never express our uh, love for our children. Yes? I'm al Muslim say when you express it, it increases. You know these words, these ahadiths from the Holy Prophet, Allahumma inni uhibba Husayna. You know when he takes him Husayn Islam in his hands, he says, Oh Allah, I love Hussein. Oh Allah, you love the one, the ones who love Hussein. Why is he expressing it? Is, is he just doing it because of Muhammad Islam? Or is he teaching us that no, we need to do that with our children? There's a whole debate. Yes, Muhammad Islam is very special. But we need to do that with our children. Communication is the key. Unfortunately, in our culture, in the Pakistani, Indian, indo pak culture, we don't communicate with our children. And expression is something negative. And sometimes we've given it a wall called respect. And we push back the children and say, no, there's a wall in between us. You're on the other end, and I'm on this end. I'm the father, and you're the son. No, you need to communicate and show. Masum al salam says that the parents who do not show any love for their children are not true parents. So you need to show love to your children. When you pick up your child and you kiss them, Masum al salam says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives. You don't even know how many sins for just that one kiss that you give to your child. Children do not understand that. You need to communicate, especially many times, not always, but many times, there is a gap between the opposite gender, especially between daughters and fathers sometimes, unfortunately. Not in the Western world, but many times in Asian countries. That shouldn't exist. We believe in the Prophet, وسلم, who used to stand up for his daughter and show the utmost respect and love and passion. He used to kiss his, her hands and her, and her forehead. So we need to express our, our ourselves with our children, okay? So communication is the key. Now, involvement. Now, I very quickly uh, made a list of a number of things that we need to communicate with our children, that I believe that we need to communicate. There, there, are, there, there can be many things. I've translated the principles of faith. Inshallah, you can find, I'll send you a link. Um, I couldn't find the link now. It was an opening up. And there are 80, 76 or 80, 86, can't remember now. Characteristics that the sixth Imam Islam has mentioned that we should all possess. She's given uh, a list of about 20 or 30 characteristics here. There are 86 characteristics that the Imam Islam has counted that you should try and all adapt. Okay? So we should have all of those characteristics in us. And if you have it in you, then you give it to your children. You try and develop all of those things in your children. Okay? Principles of faith, and there's a whole topic on akhlaq. Now there's a book called um, Sharhe Hadith e Junood e Aql o Jahan. There's a commentary on the Hadith. There's a Hadith about two pages long or three pages long that says that there are two things, <coughs> Aql and Jahal, wisdom and ignorance, and each one has their army. Now Khomeini has a whole commentary on it, 200, 300 page commentary. It, that, that's too scientific and philosophical, but the six of Islam and two giving an army for both wisdom and ignorance. So 150 characteristics is counted. 75 soldiers for wisdom and 75 soldiers of ignorance. Okay. Now he counts soldiers for each one. He says the prime minister of wisdom is knowledge. And then he, you know, the, the six of beautifully puts it in, into a hadith. So try and develop all of those things. Now involvement in education is extremely important, especially living in the West. So do you ever ask your children, what have you learned today? What have you learned this week, if you have more time every day, to talk to your children? What have you learned this month? 
Orang ilang this year, have you ever done that? Extremely important to communicate what they are learning. Yes, education. They may be picking up all sorts of things from, from schools and we never ever ask them what they are learning. <clears throat> One of the other things is um, gadgets. Uh, a picture by one of the Americans. Um, parents in 1914 on a dinner table. A picture says a thousand words. Yes? So, a cartoon, an, art, you know, an artist for a picture. What would parents look like in 1914? Everyone is sitting on the dinner table. Father on one hand, mother on the other, all the children on the dinner table, and they're all talking to each other, having food together. Dinner, supper, whatever. And they're all talking to each other. That's how um, a family looked like in 1914. Everyone communicating with each other. And parents in 2014, everyone has their gadget, and the child is saying, Then I pass is, hmm, no eye contact. The most negative thing you could ever do to your child is not to form even an eye contact. Have eye contact with each other. When they're talking to you, look at them. Don't just keep looking at your phones or you know, iPads or whatever. Yes? Communicate. Eyes convey a lot of things. Yes? Form an eye contact. Speak to them, listen to them, smile at them. Not that you know you uh, you have no importance in my life. Anything that you're doing. Is nothing. That's the message you're giving when you're looking at something. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. And you do your own things. That's the message you're conveying. No importance whatsoever. This is more important to me. No, it's not. Communicate. Form an eye contact. Okay? Now, guide them in decisions. Can I go on for another? Everyone listening so far? Decision making. Yes? They have a lot of decisions to make in their career, options at school, yes, languages they choose, the subjects they do, and further when they grow up, their marriage and all of those things, you should be helping them in making all of those decisions. When you have no role in their decisions, then the people who do have a role in their decisions become more important. I'll give you a very bad story from this year. Manchester, because you'll be going through these things in Australia 10, 20 years down the line. We're going through those things now. Career advice. Um, one of our friends is a doctor. He has his own practice. He's a general practitioner and he is involved in politics. He's a, he's a politician. And in Manchester, Manchester Europe, um, where I'm the president, he is a coordinator for Northern Areas in Imami and Hamso. So he's a very close friend of mine. Um, I was talking about career advice for all the Shia children and he told me a story. He said, Marana, extremely important. And no one thinks about it. And he said to me that, um, now that you've said it, let me tell you something. He said, recently in the, in the masjid, he said, I asked uh, a young boy, he said, um, what are you doing these days? So he said, I knew the father. He said, um, uncle, I'm becoming a carpenter. So he said, to my mind, I started thinking, well, I think he was a very intelligent child. He said, How, what grades did you get in your GCSEs? All levels, all, all levels now GCSEs. He said, what grades did you get? He said, uncle, I got 11 A's, 5 A stars and 6 A's. He said, why are you doing carpentry? He said, oh, uh, because my career advisor told me that I'd make an excellent carpentry. He said, oh, that's very good. Can you give me um, his name? He said, oh, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a lady. He said, okay, can I get her name? And make an appointment with your head teacher. Tell her that we're really pleased with this career advisor and I'll be going to see her um, with your father or your uncle. He said, I didn't let them know that I was upset. He said, went in, didn't tell them that I was a doctor. Sat down and said, um, what are the requirements for becoming a carpenter? What grades should a child get? You can fail all your GCSEs, all levels, everything, and you can still become a carpenter. He said, what are the requirements for becoming a doctor, a medical doctor? He said, you need to pass all your GCSEs and then get really good grades and A-levels. 
Is that do you think this this child that has eleven five A stars and six A's, you know, don't you think he would have made a very good doctor? Is that she suddenly turned red? Um, he said, do you think that, he said, well, I was thinking because all the carpenters, they have no education and if a good educated person became a carpenter, they would set a good example and so he started panicking. He said, um, I'm going to make an official complaint against you to the headmaster, to the local council, to the MP, and you'll be in the newspapers, I'm a politician. She started panicking and she said, please, I'll lose my job. Just forgive me this one time. He said, I'll not only just not forgive you, I'll make sure that every Pakistani, Indian, Bangladeshi, Muslim child that you advise has to be revised in the past 15 years. She lost her job and a lot of the children she had misguided because we are not taking any role in the upbringing of our children. She had been a career advisor for many years and Every child that she had advised was a Muslim. She made sure they did not go into good jobs. Now, this happened in 21st century England, Manchester, one of the biggest cities in England, um, under the very eyes of all Muslims, happening for many years, and just one person suddenly picks it up. Um, so we are we have no attention whatsoever in the career of our children. We don't ever ask them, we don't ever guide them. They can become what they, whatever they want to become, but we need to help them. Their beliefs and practices, you should make sure that whatever they're learning in Sunday Mothers, I'm not criticizing, but you need to ask, you need to get involved and say, what have you learned? What are the beliefs and practices they're picking up? Um, unfortunately, in America, we have good and bad examples of the Shia uh, communities. I'll give you a good example and a bad example. The good example is that they have the English Majlis in the same hall where they have the Urdu Majlis. So the parents actually listen to everything that the English speakers are saying to, to the children. So they actually monitor everything. And in many cities, they have separate English Majlises, communication gap between the two, two different styles of Majlis going on at the same time. And one is one extreme, the other is the other extreme. So there's this whole generation gap, cultural gap, conflict, and sometimes distorted beliefs and then there is a conflict inside of parents saying, well hang on, who told you this? He said, oh the Maulana. You're not educated. You don't even pray full time. And the Maulana told me that this is what Islam is all about. And, and sometimes they're getting the wrong ideas because parents have no direct involvement. So they can be misguided because they haven't been listening. So do not ever make a um, a segregated, uh, a, 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 you know, a, a, a bridge between you and the next generation. So they should be always together so you understand what they're going through. You should always monitor everything they learn and ask them. Um, gender relationship, we already have problems in Britain. I hope nothing like that here. At the moment we do have a lot of people who have confusions about uh, gender in Islam, you know, um, um, I have to be explicit, excuse me for this, but because it is for parents, uh, many are now going into forming relationship with their own gender. Yes, so we have gays and lesbians. Um, a parent once communicated with me and they said that our child, has this, this is what our son has decided. I said try and communicate, treat them like people who are unwell, people who need treatment. There are two treatments you could give them. One is of a criminal, which all ulama keep doing. And I've recently complained to the officers of Maraje that we need to now revise our teachings rather than saying criminals, treat them like people who need treatment, people who are sick. When a person becomes ill, they go through treatment. So don't treat them like criminals because that's what they're being taught at schools. Recently in Britain, they have started a movement because Britain was the first country to, to legalize, yes? same-sex marriages and everything. So they have recently now started from nurseries. A book called Adam and Steve, not Adam and Eve, Adam and Habani, but Adam and Steve. You should remove homophobia from the children. 
they should not hate people who do such things. And if you're doing it, then you are criminals. So in Britain now, they've made it into a crime. Now this, this couple, they threw their son out of the family. And they said, you must leave the house. We don't want any of our other children to have this. After a while, the communication started breaking, and then the parents lost control. And then one day, he sent back the Jai Namaz, Sishdaga, Tasbi, everything. He said, I don't want to even pray. I don't believe in anything now. And I said to them, that, look, he's sinful, but at least he believes. Treat him like someone who is sick rather than someone who is a criminal. Because he has been told by the GP, by his schoolmates, by his teachers, by counselors that he is perfect. There's nothing wrong with him. And you are telling him that no, this is against faith. So you need to communicate. You have left everything to everyone else and now you're saying that I need to impose my teachings on you. So these problems will, God forbid, arise in other places as well. We are now uh, uh, facing this in Britain and also in North America as well. I hope I'm not frightening you too much. Um, holidays. Where do you take your holidays? Australia is very far, but I'm a Muslim, so always take good holidays. Yes? Hajj, Ziyarat, Umrah. A spiritual journey is a transformation of a lifetime. Many people completely transform with one Ziyarat trip in their life. I'm a Muslim, so you don't even understand how much it means to visit us. Just one Ziyarat transforms a person completely. So Ziyarat trips are very important. So, you know, every few years, holidays, you should try and encourage your children to save up and go for Ziyarat. Do, you know, there's a, there are hadiths that encourage that you should always try and visit. Yes, al Salam. Um, once every few years. Some, some hadiths say once every four years or once every six years, you should try and visit the al Salam. It gives you that special spiritual strength. Many children don't even grow up properly. They're physically grown up, but mentally they're still children. So they do a lot of childish things because their childhood did not come out. You know, you did not play with them. You did not let them live like children. You started treating them like young adults and started saying, grow up, be sensible. No, they're children. Let them be children. Okay? So many of them, they grow up and they're still children. They do childish things because they haven't grown up. Um, there are now cultural differences. A lot of the parents are saying that we, our children are confused. Are they Australians or are they Pakistanis? Your children are not confused, for God's sake. They're all Australians. You are confused. Yes? I hope it wasn't too abrupt. But actually, we are confused. Children are not. They're Australians. Okay? So you need to understand that they are a different culture and you need to uh, to understand where they're coming from and try and overcome the, the barrier between you and them, the cultural differences, okay? Try and make them understand. Now, there is an identity crisis. In Britain, there are already books and researches, researches coming out, identity crisis. What is being a Muslim in 21st century in Britain, for example, or in Australia? What does it mean to be a Muslim? You can develop a very good society because you don't have the amount of problems that my father's generation went through. A lot of the things already exist. You're now newcomers, and the world has evolved, the world has changed. From 50s and 60s and 70s to 21st century, there is a lot of difference, okay? So you have a lot of positive in this country that probably the people in Britain did not have. My generation is a lost generation in Europe, well, in Britain, not all of you. In Britain, the people who came in the 50s and 60s, and even 70s, are from the 70s generation, I should have said, 60s, 50s, and 60s only. Uh, 50s, 60s, and 70s. That generation is lost. Not all, but not every single person has to be lost, then you say that it's a lost generation. If majority are lost, 60-70%, then that's a lost generation. Okay? So, um, all the parents who came to Britain in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, they are parents of lost generation. Okay? Not all, but they, they lost their children. 
A lot of them now openly say it. The first generation did not admit, but now many of the parents are saying that we came here for better future of our children, better wealth, but we lost our children. But it's also happening in our countries. Okay. Last thing before I take on questions. The effects of social media. Last two things that I want to briefly talk about. Social media, how How do we control it? We're all into gadgets, and we are completely taken over by those things. Uh, you know, the people who made it are all Americans in California. I don't want to say their names, but one of them was recently asked, was interviewed. He said, what do you think of what you've done? You know, the iPad, everything, you know, the smartphones. He said, if you want to truly ask me, that's not what we had planned. We had something else in mind. We had this concept, an idea, this notion of, <coughs> of taking technology to every household. Not that the technology takes over you. Pay attention. You are not made for this dunya. Dunya is made for you. You are not made for wealth. Wealth is made for you. When you start to serve wealth, then you have made yourself subservient to wealth. But when wealth serves you, then that's the right way. We are not made for dunya. Allah SWT says in Hadith Qudsi, Ayyuhal insan, khalaqtu al-ashya ali ajli wa khalaqtu ka li ajli. Oh man, I made everything for you, but I made you for myself. You are mine. You're not of this dunya. But what we've done is that we have become subservience to this dunya. Now, social media was made for us to communicate better, to control our, yes, our decisions. But we have now lost power of decision. Everyone listening? Yes. What is the power of decision? Even if I don't tell them what to bring, I just give them a quick list and then I'll just phone them. No, don't do that. Use your brain fully. How people used to do before. Yes? Have full control and put your phone aside. If you forget, then you use the phone. Not that you've already decided, if I forget, I'll use the phone anyway. So you've already given in that I, I'm feeling to forget. No, try not to. Yes? I recently, you know, I was very good with, with roads and, 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 and journeys. My parents from very childhood, you know, I was seven, eight. If I went to any place once, I could go back, no matter how complicated it was. Uh, my mother has uh, a very good photographic memory, so I, I inherited from her some things. And recently, I I was going somewhere, and, and I was going to use my satellite, you know, satellite navigation system. And I said, "Hang on, I've been to this place more than ten times. Why am I using satellite?" But because the technology has taken over me, it has taken the power of thinking. So I try and not use it anymore. Because in the past many years I've used it so much so that it has taken over my thinking ability, my memory. Don't let social media do that to you. That's what it is doing to us. Okay? Don't let that happen. Everything is... Now one of the worst things that social media is doing is um, which is haram in Islam if shy fahsha in Arabic, they call it Quran says, Indeed, the people who like to disclose the secrets and the sins of Mu'mineen, they have punishment in this world and the hereafter. Now, social media has become the, the basis of spreading sins, yes, disclosing everything. Masum alayhi wa sallam, Masum says that even if you sin, then be ashamed of your sin. Don't disclose it to everyone. Hide and cover your sin. And social media says the opposite. Disclosing and sharing everything is good. Okay? And that's a negative thing. I don't want to go more into that. And the last thing is patience. A sabro min al iman karakse min al jasad. Imam says that. 
Patience is to faith like head is to body. So if there is no head, there is no use of body. So if there is no sub, if there is no patience, then there is no iman. Iman and sabr are connected to each other. They always remain together. If one leaves, the other one also leaves. Similar things have said have been said by for Haya as well, chastity. Yes. So patience is extremely important. Imam Ali Islam says, and then I'll end on this, and I'll take questions. He says that <coughs> I have done so much sub, I have done so much, I you know I have so much patience that even now sub looks at me. The patience comes and looks at me and says, Ya Ali, till when will you have sub? Even the patience has given up on me. That's how much patience I have. Now, you need a lot of patience with, with young people, especially in Western countries. They will do all sorts of things, but that doesn't mean that you don't control. Who is the boss? The parents. Who needs to know that? The children. Do they know that? Unfortunately, you know, in America, one of the people came and said, Marna, my 12 year old, he, he said, I'm not going to Majlis today, I'm going home tomorrow. I said, did you also tell him that, okay, don't come to Majlis, but don't watch television? He said, no, he's going to do that. So I said, well, you know, does your child know who is the boss? A 12 year old is running your life now? You can't even control a 12 year old? So they usually become your bosses and they become your parents. They need to know that they are not the parents, you are. How do you do that? Hitting is not a solution, and if you hit and make a mark, then you have to pay a penalty as well. Uh, if they become red, blue, then they realize it's too much. But even if they just turn red, well, they may just turn red. But even if you smack and you make a mark, then there's a penalty, even for your own children. If the mother hits, then she has to pay the penalty to the father, and if the father hits, then he has to pay the penalty to the mother. I'm not going to tell that to the children, so if you record it. Otherwise, a new chapter opens up of, of penalties. Um, now that applies to anyone and everyone. You can't hit anyone. If you hit someone and you make a mark, then you have to pay a penalty. That applies to everyone, even your own children. Okay, With other people, husband, wives, friends, and anyone, you know, even enemies. You, how far can you go in everything? Now, I would like to end on this, but how do you control? Yes? The last note on this. How do you make sure that the child, from very early age, from 6, 7, when you, the Masmir al Muslim say, when they're 6 and 7, you start to tell them that you are in control and they shouldn't be controlling your life from 6, 7 onwards. And you should make them practice everything. Um, that doesn't mean that you become over strict or you cross your boundaries. Give them the freedom. I never ever sit down and argue with my children. But they know when I've said something that it is a final. The only dispute me and my wife always have is that she always has to tell them off and I never do that. So she always has a word with that you never ever say anything. Because I travel so much so I try and not be in the bad books of my children. Um, so I always try and avoid telling off. But I do put my foot down and I say, no, this has to be done this way. But my children know that this is final. They will not argue with me, they will not fight with me, they will not answer back. You have to do that from a very early age. Well, my children are only, you know, the, 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 the biggest child is now going to be 13 in the next few months. So, they're still not teenagers. But we still have to try and tell them, you know, discipline is extremely important. If you don't have discipline, then the children will get out of hands. They will not have any rules. Um, and I had devised a chart, but I'm not going to go into that. Uh, in the Western world, we always hear about uh, a word, a term, rights. <coughs> These are my rights. But they never talk about responsibilities. So whenever they talk about rights, we talk about responsibilities. And there has to be a balance between rights and responsibilities. You get this right because of this responsibility. If you haven't shown any responsibility, then you don't deserve your rights. Islam says social rights overrule personal rights. Britain gave this notion to the whole world and the Western world follows it that personal rights overrule social rights. 
Did everyone understand that? And do you, do, do, do you see it? Or do I need to explain? <coughs> okay, I didn't want to go to that. I'll give you two examples very quickly. In Britain, we have motorway M62 between Manchester and Bradford. And when you're traveling, the highest point comes on that. And there is a house in the middle of the mountain. And the, you know, the motorway or highway, whatever you call them, here, yeah, um, is going from two sides. So this person did not sell his house. He said, no, I want to sell. So they said, okay, fine. We'll make the motorway on two sides. You won't have any access to your house. So the house is still there. And they say, this is a sign of British legal system. Individual rights overrule social rights. If it was an Islamic state, they would say no because you are usurping the rights of all the people that will be using the highway. So you will be forcefully removed from here. Now, they built the motorway and now he's lost access. But they said, no, we, we still left the house. <coughs> so he has a house, but he can't sell it. He can't do anything to it. So they've done it the other way around, yes? You either hold the ear from this side or you know from the other side. The end result is the same. But Islam says social rights, something is haram, haram for everyone. Something is wajib, is wajib for everyone. Pay attention. There are certain rules and there may be exceptions for it. Unless the masoom says that this is an exception, there is no exception. Every, no one is exempted. Everyone has to obey. When the Holy Prophet said, for example, uh, you know, the witness is half, but Fatima Zahra has an exemption. He, he said it. But there are many women who have more abilities than many men. Yes? But Islam says the rules will apply. Wajibat will not change. This person has the ability to do <coughs> ten prayers. No, Allah says only five are wajib. So social rights always overrule individual rights. I can give you many, many different examples from the Holy Quran and the lives of Masumin al Islam. Just one example if you want, otherwise I'll just leave it here. Shall I give another example? Now, a person sold his house to another person in the Tower of the Holy Prophet and so the person who bought the house, he came running to the Holy Prophet and said, Ya I bought the house and this man still enters my house without permission. <coughs> so the Holy Prophet said, call him. And so the person came and the Holy Prophet said, why do you enter his house without his permission? He said, Ya Rasulullah, when I sold the house, I made an intention that there is a tree in the, in the back garden and I'm not selling that tree to him. So that tree is still mine and I must have access to my tree. So I have to go through his house. And, so, and I don't need permission because it's my tree. So the Holy Prophet said, said okay, uh, I'll buy that tree off you and I'll sell you one tree in the paradise. Meaning he's giving him the guarantee that you will go to the paradise, otherwise you won't get the tree in the paradise. He said, I don't want it. He said, I'll give you ten in paradise. He said, I don't want it. He said, I'll give you one hundred trees in paradise. He said, I don't want it. He said, now I'm overruling all of those things. Dig out his tree and give it to him. And he said, now all the trees that I was promising you, the angels were planting them as I was saying. Now that you refuse, they have removed all of your trees. You refuse my decision, you don't get the tree from the paradise, and you get your tree, take it to your house. So the Holy Prophet dug out the tree and gave it to him. Social rights, he said, because I allow this one person, the entire society will suffer. Social rights always overrule individual rights. I hope it gives you a better understanding. I could go on and on about this one thing, but I'll take questions now. But Muhammad al Muhammad. Thank you, Anasa, for an enlightening uh, speech and uh, very informative. So, um, before we go into questions, we will take a uh, uh, quick ten minutes to discuss the survey that we um, got from uh, you, and thank you for that a little earlier. Now, a uh, little more on these, the, the survey. And in this time, please, uh, if you have questions, you can uh, write down a piece of paper. You are also welcome to ask uh, from the floor later. So 
those survey questions more or less were based on uh, two sets of researches that were done. Um, uh, the first one was uh, from Cancer Council Victoria, and uh, that was on Australian secondary school students um, and what do they think, and there were questions asked to them and what the responses they provide. So it's really a perspective of the uh, students' community at large and what do they think on those questions, um, a cross-section of the student population across in Victoria. Um, the other one was done by Detroit University, um, and it was about uh, the fifth national survey of Australian secondary students. So, what I would do is, we have the slides up. So, we've actually collated the questions that you have provided, uh, responses that you have provided, and what do you think, with, and compared to what do the students um, out um, from the larger population think, not necessarily you know, our uh, children, but putting into perspective as to when they go out um, and when they mingle with you know, students in their schools, university, what is the perspective that they are seeing. So it's really just to get those two side by side to see, well, you know, do, are we aligned, are we not aligned, what is it looking like, it's more thought-provoking. <coughs> if you have questions on that, please write down and we might um, ask our Moana's help to you know, discuss on those topics as well. So without, once we have the presentation up. There were questions um, on the topics of uh, smoking, alcohol, drugs. Um, and then there was uh, another one on sexual behavior as well. So it is really um, giving a perspective of what um, they do um, here and you know, what do their peers when they're studying out there in the university thing. So the first question. First question was about uh, what percentage of secondary school children, 12 to 17, have reported they have never smoked a cigarette in their life, and most of the parents responded with the. You want some more time? Two minutes, okay. So in this two minutes, what I would do is ask uh, Morasa for one of the questions that came before. Maybe can answer. decisions about our children's future, they will have a lot more to say in, about their future. Um, and we need to realize that it is their decisions we're making. Um, we have had a very big problem in, uh, in, in, in Britain. The government has now got involved and they've made a life miserable for people who want their children to get married from back home. India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, especially from Pakistan, Bangladesh. Now, the first generation used to choose, and they say that, well, my nephews and nieces are to be married to my children. And there were a lot of cultural differences. Children were being brought up in, in, um, in Britain and back home. They were from villages. And what happened was that those differences arose and it made a lot of problems. So a lot of the children went and divorced and they started complaining to the government and the government got involved and they said, well, now you can't marry your children until before they are 21 from abroad. They can get married here before that, but not before. Now, so there are all, all of these things and the, the parents and children, there should, should be communication from an earlier stage. Uh, in our culture, we don't, we, we don't talk about these things, but we need to try and communicate the concept of kuf Compatibility, how you make decisions, do we want to still choose, do we allow them? These are all the things that you will be facing in this country. We're already facing them in Europe. In North America, it's a lot worse. In, 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 in Europe, we 
you'll have a lot more control, you'll have a lot more questions on it. I don't want to go too much into this now. Um, but the parents need to have a strategy device amongst themselves. You know, they, they both need to be on the same page. Um, I have so many families now referring. If you look at the family section, we unfortunately now have more than 30% divorce rate in Britain amongst the Shias. Um, now, one of the things is that mother says that I want my children, you know, my children to mar get married to so and so, and the father says I don't want to marry my children. So the parents should be on the same page. They first should devise a strategy that they are on the same page, and that's how they would convince the children to be on the same page. If the parents themselves have dispute, believe me, you, your children will manipulate that difference to getting what they want by making this fight bigger. So they can use that, manipulate that, and avoid all the relationships to keep ties with the family, to get married to the family, and all of those things. And they will um, uh, escape your decisions. So you need to be on the same page before you expect your children to be on the same page. Now, um, back to the survey. So we had uh, the first question which said, what percentage, percentage of secondary school children, 12 to 17 years, have reported they've never smoked a cigarette in their life. And majority of the parents uh, think that it's 24, whereas the children are saying that it's 77%. So can I clearly see that, you know, they're doing really well in that space, and you can go to the next slide, which is showing the different picture of the same question, what percentage of secondary school children have reported they had smoked a cigarette in the last 12 months. So they're saying that there's only 16% of them are saying, yes, they have, whereas the parent thinks that it's 53%. Who have um, again, you know, going back to the the bit where the survey um, on the right really shows the answers from the greater population of children out there, which our um, children go and interact with. So next slide. Um, this one talks about alcohol, and the question is, what percentage of secondary school children, 12 to 17, have reported they had an alcoholic drink in the last 12 months? Um, majority of our parents think it's 51%. And they're saying 51% so really aligned. Um, you can go to the next slide, which actually goes a little bit deeper. And as you can see, when the age goes up, that response is, you know, changes drastically. So when they're younger, um, it's really low, but as they go older, you know, the students when they or the children when they're saying they actually have used or, or had a drink when they're in the in the older age, so it's kind of, kind of something to be cautious about, um, more or less. So if you move, move on to the next, and if you have any questions, please note it down, we might come, uh, have the, this in the discussion, uh, in the question answer session later. Um, next slide, um, Now, what percentage of secondary school children, 12 to 17, have reported they have never had an alcoholic drink in their life, and really, you can see we're still, um, pre-aligned in the perception. You can go to the next slide. Um, that was related to the previous question. The breakdown was kind of similar um, in the slide before. Um, now, questions about drugs. And um, what percentage of secondary school children have reported that they had used an illicit drug at least once in their lifetime? You can actually see the parents think 11% here, but you know the responses have been out there in the community to be 16%. Um, we go to the next slide, which does a breakdown. If we have a two um, group uh, of those 12 to 17 into a 12 to 15 and 16, 17, you can see a really big difference. Um, something to be mindful of. Um, now, next slide. And then the, there was a question about which was reported as the most commonly used drug by secondary school children, and our parents think cannabis, and you know that that's actually right. So that's kind of something to be, you know, bit, bit concerned and mindful of, so that we actually know we can have the right discussion. So this is the last question, which actually says, and that's part of the Latrobe uh, University survey of what percentage of secondary school children have reported they have had engaged in some form of sexual behavior at least once in their lifetime. Our parents think that it's 31%. Um, out there in the community, they're saying it's 69%, which is kind of alarming. Um, you can go to the next slide. 
we have one. So, we, well, the age breakdown was kind of similar to what we saw as a trend in the other questions, um, more or less. Now that is, and thank you for the survey. Um, and we just wanted to bring this to the perspective so that we can have this in, in our discussion question answers. Um, so that's pretty much it. So we'll probably open up for questions now and ask for answer to come and you can probably start with the questions already as a good number. to raise your hand and, and ask questions if you had any, even from the answers that I'm giving or any other questions that you may have from the things that I have said. The other question here, you said children are Australians, we are confused, not they are. Um, then they ask us to let them groom like Australians, how to convince them that Islamic limitations are for the benefits and they are Muslims by faith. Children are not confused. They are Canadians, they are Australians, they are Americans, they are, they are British. Especially now that we are slowly losing touch with the base. If I'm the second generation, my parents came to Britain in the 60s. Um, they went back. I was born in Lahore, they came back. My, gener my children are third generation. Um, they've never been to Pakistan. Slowly, they still call themselves Pakistanis. In cricket, they're supporting Pakistani, Pakistan Zindabad, whatever you want to. But they're slowly. I don't fit in Pakistan when I go back. I'm more British than Pakistani in terms of system. But I will always remain a Pakistani in Britain because of my skin color, because of my face, because of my. And my children also have Pakistani dress and whatever you call it. We still have uh, the Pakistani foods at home. In, in fact, the Pakistanis have actually given the Pakistani food to the British. Uh, they call it Indian, uh, you know, cuisine or whatever. But they still remain, by their skin color, Pakistanis. Now, how do we tell them that our values are more worthy? You need to give importance to the values of your faith. Not because of Pakistani values. Islamic values have precedence wherever you live. Whether in Arabian countries, in Iran, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India, or any other part of the world. And that's what you need to convince your children. You should not be telling them that our values are more, uh, more worthy. Because we're Pakistan. No, because Islamic values. Pakistan is an Islamic country. Indian Muslims, Bangladeshi Muslims, Arab Muslims, Iranian Muslims, Afghan Muslims, they all have Islamic values. Because they have developed a culture, they have developed a society in those countries. They have been there for centuries. And here, we are recent immigrants. It will take time before we develop. Look at our languages. Our forefathers came from Arabia, you know, from, from Iran, Iran into the subcontinent. They took up a new language, Hindi. They named it Urdu. They changed the writing, like Arabic. They gave it a lot of terminology. So the same Hindi when Muslims speak it, it has all Islamic terminology. In fact, our forefathers were so influential, they gave the Islamic terminology to the Hindus. Go to the Indian courts, they still use the Islamic terms. Dafa team, so though Dafa is an Arabic term. All the Islamic terminology, all the Islamic legal system is still exists in India because the forefathers were so powerful. So if we start to give into this society, then we have given up all of our faith and our values. So you need to tell them that no Islamic values have precedence over everything. And being Pakistani, <coughs> Indians, or whatever. We still have a lot more Islam in our values than the Australians because they had no Islam here. Islam is new to Australia. But it was, it had lived for centuries in India, Pakistan, and all of those countries. Did everyone understand that? 
So that way you can actually very easily tell them that our values are still more Islamic because they were, uh, you know, uh, because our forefathers gave those Islamic values to the society. Okay. If taking oppression is haram, how do we handle the oppression from uh, our parents? In terms of looks, taunting, physical abuse. I'm not saying that you should not be harsh or you should not be strict. I've always emphasized on discipline. But discipline does not mean that you have to be physical. You have to hit and you need to be oppressive. Discipline can come through other ways. Shouting can help at times, but don't, don't make a habit of it. That until you shout, your child does not listen to you. Don't give that habit to the children. Good parenting means that from very early childhood, you teach them all of those values. Don't bring them to a state where you have to hit them to, to, to discipline them. But many parents have actually done that. So until and unless you give them that push on the hand or on the back, they will not listen. So you have done it, so you have to live with it. Meaning you may, that that may be the only way forward, unfortunately. How can we control children from avoiding from multimedia when the quote is the saying of Muhammad that they are one generation ahead. Yes, they are more intelligent. They have a lot more uh, knowledge and sophistication about the social media, about multimedia, about everything. You should have hours on how much television they can watch, how much computer they can use, so discipline them. You have two hours of television, but then you have to read. If you eat a chocolate, you'll have a fruit. I don't know. In Britain now, they have actually banned uh, junk food from schools. You can't use any junk food in, in schools. Chocolates, crisps, or uh, you know any of these things. If schools can do it, then why can't the homes? You can do it at home. But you need to discipline them. You tell them that you will not be watching television for more than so many hours. You will not be on your computer for more than an hour. Set them time for everything. Set them time for Quran, for namaz, for everything. They should rotate their timetable around namaz and other things rather than it's, I'll try and find time for namaz. If the parents have no importance for any of these religious things, then the children will not have any place for religious things in their lives. The mothers sometimes, you know, they can be um, more protected than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, it's why for them to do namaz in time and say, oh, you're tired, do qawah later. Why? Allah who's made, even you love, loves them more than you. Don't tell them to do, make it qawah. If the mothers, you know, say, okay, it's okay, you can skip your two rosas, you know. Then you're giving them wrong messages about Islam, about values, okay? You need to be strict. You need to put your foot down and say, no, you have to. Do your namaz, come and have dinner. So that way the child knows what is right and what is wrong. But if you tell them that it's okay, it's very difficult, I understand, then you're telling them, no, there is no importance of it. So giving them the right message is extremely important, and you can do that. But you need to understand how important it is. Please recommend only uh, any book, book to read for parenting teenage children in sight of Masumin value. Now, views. Um, recently, I was teaching something in, in London and then someone said, I wish there was a, um, a manual for parents to, to go through that. This is, you know, in, in child psychology, they have everything and they describe exactly how your child would be. Your child has now turned six. They will be doing these things. And that's how they exactly are. Earlier on in my speech, I had said that we did not, Muslims did not, there's a, there's a Western writer, he says that Islam is still the best religion. He's not a Muslim. But Muslims did not develop their social sciences. Psychology, sociology, anthropology, none of these things. You know, we did not develop them. Recently, there are many books coming out on all of these topics, but mainly in Farsi. Many in Arabic as well, but mainly in Farsi. So uh, there are not many translations of many of these works. But there are many now big psychologists who are writing on these things from the Quranic um, uh, point of view. 
I don't know, Mini has worked. There are many other so, uh, social um, scientists who are, who are working in Iran, uh, Ms. Yazi. If you can find any translations, I mainly read in, in Arabic and Farsi. Um, uh, if someone could email me, then I would probably email a list of, of some of the works that I, I can recommend, and then they can send it out to all of the parents. Um, uh, if let's say a mother wasn't religious like uh, while pregnant, what can she do to, to make up for the children missing out while in her home? Now, your children will always, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always gives an, an advantage to the children who will depart of certain things. Okay? Many of the people who are converts, you will see they have a lot more potential because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes up for the things that they missed out. So, a child who has no sight, their ears will be stronger than other people so they don't trip over, they don't have accidents, you know. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if, if something is taken away, then he replaces it with something else. So, if a mother had missed out, then Allah will, and now she becomes religious, then Allah will give her more ability to make up for the time that she had missed out if she truly becomes religious and says, oh Allah, help me. It's a dua from Muhammad sallallahu in Sayyidah Sajjadiyya, that whenever you're worried about your children, and read this du'a. Um, uh, uh, this, this lady said to me that I have seven grown-up children and whenever they are arguing with me or they are arguing amongst themselves, I always close myself in a room and I read this du'a from Imam Sajjad and they always say, what do you go, what do you do in that room? It changes our mood. <laughs> it's a du'a that has that power, yes? So Imam Sajjad is Islam's du'a for the children. So inshallah, I read that du'a. It will help you as, as a parent. As a parent, to what extent? Do we implement cultural values into our children's lives? What is the limit? Many cultures are Islamic cultures. Islam does not have a culture. There's a whole debate. Does Islam have a culture? You know, for example, the Holy Prophet wore Arabian dress. He wore an Obama. He wore Abba Abba, like what I'm wearing. Um, you know, he um, his footwear and everything. Islam does Islam have a culture? There's a whole debate in Iran. Obviously, Muslims are going through all of these changes. Islam says this is halal. How you cook it? Do you put chilies in it? Or do you not? Do you fry it? This is all cultural. Islam says this is halal. How you do it is up to you. How you cook your fish, how you cook your mutton, your beef, whatever, chicken, is up to you. Islam says this is how you make it halal, and then the rest is up to you. Islam says you cover yourself. How you cover yourself is up to you. These are the things that you need to do. Islam says wajibat are very few, all the rest are cultural things and cultural values. Many of the Muslims, when they migrated to different countries, they took those Islamic values with them and they gave those good concepts to the other people. One, uh, probably five minutes to a few minutes. The time is finished and I still have a, a bundle of questions. There is a difference between conquerors and immigrants. The Muslims that came to the subcontinent of Indian Pakistan, they had conquered India. So they had the upper hand. They were rulers. So they gave their values to the Hindus. And we are the lower hand. We came for a better future to these countries. So my father's generation, not, Alhamdulillah, not me, and my children don't have any racism whatsoever. But my father's generation, he would always say, for example, Gora Khala Tumhara Zahar Tum Gaini? So what if he is white? You know, it makes no difference to me. He has the same value as a black person for me. Or a Pakistani or an Indian, whatever, yes? But the first generation came with that impression that no, they are superior. We came for a better future here, okay? So the first generation to Australia will always have that inferiority complex. Our children speak better English than us, our, the, those locals are better. No, they are not. Get rid of those mentality. You're equals. Okay? Until and unless you start to feel that and believe that, you will not be able to give it to your children. You will not be able to give that respect and dignity to your children. They will always feel Gogora. No, there's no difference whatsoever. Okay? White person has no superiority over any other person. Okay, so we should not have the inferiority complex. And that we must rid ourselves of and must give those good values to our children and say Islam has precedence over everything else. 
Um, last question. Last question we'll take. Our youth have been infiltrated with materialistic world. How do we introduce, increase, and enhance them spiritually? Um, spirituality is not like not like a drug, not like a medicine that you can inject and then you start feeling it. It's not over a night. It's over a time. It has to come from inside. Sincerity, yes, ikhlas, sincere intentions, these are all, you know, inside the heart. I still remember the most, the greatest impact anyone ever had on me was my mother, yes. More than my teachers and more than some of the great, you know, the grand idols that I ever learned from, I learned a lot from them. But my mother was the, the most important. I still remember that my my um, my cousin, she was a lot older than us, and she would always, you know, crack jokes <coughs> and, and, and say things to my mother. And we would all laugh. And she once said a, a joke and my mother did not laugh, and we were all laughing at the joke. <coughs> and and my mother said, I said, why don't you laugh? And I was probably six, seven. I still remember, she said, no, because it's talking about hurting someone's feelings. How can you laugh at such a thing? And that stuck with me. It's not over one night, over one day. It is a process that you give to your children. And if you're not spiritual, then it is only a lip service you do to your children. Something that comes from heart goes into the heart. If you're only doing a lip service and saying, be spiritual, and you have no spirituality yourself, do you think it will have an effect? So you have to have it in you to be able to give it to your child. My father never ever told us to do something. He always practiced it. He used to do the namaz himself. Not expect us to do it and say, do your namaz and you've never done it. No. Be practical. My father is an extremely practical person. I picked up those things from him. He didn't tell me you see, teaching is of two ways, and I'll end. One is that you tell your child and teach them, and the other one is that you practice it. The best way is to practice. And that transfers. That is the best method of teaching, rather than just saying it and not doing it yourself. Then your children will not pick it up. Your children will not practice. Um, I went to a household and they said that the children were, um, you know, pretending to be characters of a film they had watched. I went to another household. Um, they said, Morna, our son copies you exactly. He reads, you know, just like you, and he tries to tie his mother's uh, dupatta on his head. And, you know, so I really was fascinated. A very small child, and he had learned a lot of the words. He had learned many words wrong. He was very small. But he had learned a lot of words. I was really fascinated by what you give, you know, the environment, the mahal has a lot of impact. What you give to your child at home, you know, you put in the seed for an onion and then expect an apple, and then you're a fool. You will only and only get back what you have So yes. So try and be more spiritual yourself and you will see the effects. وآخر دعوانا أن الحمد لله رب العالمين. Dear parents, I know you can say about your kids, please relax. Your kids have been looked after. They are volunteers who are looking after your kids. Your mother has just finished. And I will take two minutes, and then I will pass it on to the MC. Who will take that minute, and we'll have lunch and awards first. Um, the reason why we're here today, and I just want to highlight the reason why we're here today. What are the people who are working behind the scenes? Who are they and why are they doing this? A group of youth, um, most of us have been teaching in Madrasa for a while, have been actively working in the youth group and many different, uh, in different platforms, came together and had a discussion about a year ago, concerned about the youth of our community, seriously concerned. They are serious concerned about youth right now, and we are trying to work out how to assist them, how to assist the parents, assist the kids. We've been having our discussions, we've formed a group of youth together, 
Um, and first and foremost, we've realized that before we can even assist or facilitate, we need to teach ourselves. We need to make sure that we are learning ourselves. So every fortnight, Tuesday, we meet together, we learn on aqai, akhlaq, we learn on different topics, and we have our discussions on the social issues faced by the youth. We are, our aim is to put together resources, uh, PowerPoint presentations, um, pamphlets, booklets for the youth to deal with these issues. Issues of homosexuality, issues of dealing with the opposite gender, serious issues that's out there. While we're doing that, we've also taken the opportunity to meet the ulama. Of course, we are not learned individuals. We are only here and we are learning ourselves. So we will be guided by the ulama. So we've had different discussions with many ulama. Ali Reza Rizvi was one of the first ulama that we've had a chat with. Muhammad Nakwi, Muhammad Zaidi, Mujahid Sharif. And we've had discussions about what we're doing and how to do this. Muhammad himself gave us this idea, and that's why we're here today. And other, other ulama have also given us ideas which we're working on as we speak. So again, what is the purpose? The purpose is to, provoke, to assist the youth. Now, one of the main aims that we had from the beginning was to create a mentorship program. A program where we, the youth who have gone through these issues, can then assist and facilitate your children. Have a discussion with them, out of the mambar, out of the mosque, take them out for lunch, take them out for dinner, encourage them to, to engage with the community, and also have a platform for them to ask the questions. Sometimes they have a question that they might not be able to feel comfortable asking you, for example or asking the ulama sometimes, and maybe we can fill that gap. Now, again, we are not learned individuals, so we will be obviously get, get, getting assistance from the ulama themselves. We're living in a cyber world. When we put together a presentation, we can send it to any of the ulama, and they send us back with feedback and corrections. So we are, again, using these technology for our own benefit. So today, we are here today to provide this program for the parents. And our aim in the future is also to continue providing resources, using all the other organizations working on this area, and to facilitate the parents, and most importantly, start working with the youth. So we will need your support, we will need your ongoing support to, to come together, to, to, and especially when we approach the kids, that you know who are working behind the scenes, and why are we doing this. Some of the people I would like to identify are uh, Brother, uh, uh, Brother Raza Merchant, uh, Brother Hussein, Raza Abbas, Ali Gulani, myself, Brother Wasi, Brother Hussain Ali Khan, I don't know anyone, Brother Ali, Ali Bhai, Sinema Day. This is the group. We have no name, we have no association with any organization. We are working with all the organizations out there, as you saw on the platform as well, taking their resources and supporting the parents. And again, we will continue doing that in the future. Uh, I really appreciate your attendance today. This is a great motivation for us, and inshallah, we will continue working on this in the future. Salawat from Muhammad Abraham. Oh. Um, I don't have much left to say in the purpose uh, of why we came today, and we hope that you benefited from this parenting program. Um, and as as my brother said, uh, you the support that is given by um, by all of you, the parents, is, is vital for anything further that uh, we want to achieve. Thank you all for attending. I'd like to thank Mulana Saab, uh, who presented uh, to us today, uh, and. He's only, I, I suppose he's still jet lagged, uh, he's probably still tired, uh, but you couldn't even tell in, in most of his presentation. So I'd like to thank him for, um, for his commitment uh, to, to the betterment of every community all over the world. Um, and obviously, second, uh, Sister Monique, um, now her details will provide as well. Uh, Sister Monique's details are there, Malani Ali Reza Rizvi's details are there, and his majalis, his lectures are also uh, on that website, so you can always go and uh, listen to them. I would like to thank all our sponsors, uh, Alasso Society, Light for Life, uh, Amar Federation, Planck Society of Victoria, and Koya Jamaat. Uh, without them, also, this program could not have been done um, as well as it did. So I'd like to thank them also. Uh, and inshallah, is a salawat for all the sponsors. Salawat on Muhammad. <laughs>
lunch. So Muslim is just outside. If you go straight out, it's on your left. We'll pray in here, inshallah, we'll pray Jamaat. Uh, and followed by that, there's lunch outside. So please do stay for that. And we have a lot to organize that here. So thank you all for attending. Salam. Oh, 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 oh,